to a Trump. Uh, but let's talk about Boris. We've got with us someone very special. He worked with Boris Johnson and, in fact, helped him become the Mayor of London back in 2007. Delighted to welcome two outsiders again. Assistant Minister to the Prime Minister, James McGrath. How are you? Uh, well, I no longer have that title. Oh, but what like, a shame. Um, yeah. <laughs> That's such a good title. What's Right no, no, I no longer have that one. So, but um, well, you better change your wiki page. Yeah, I, I need yeah. to do that. But um, do that. the best thing is that Boris is Prime Minister of the UK, and we've got a friend in Downing Street, someone who loves Australia. Yep. But more importantly for the world, there's someone in Downing Street who's got a brain and is prepared to use it. Now, you worked with him. Take us back to 2007. What was your role? We've got a photo of the two of you together. Um, tell us about the mayoral election in 2007, what he's like as a person and what you did to help get him into power in the first place. Well, I was, I was his deputy campaign director un under the great Linton Crosby, and our job was, was a big one, actually, because London is a Labor town. It is a left-wing town. Yep. And the construct that is the Greater London Authority or the Mayor of London, it's a new Labor invention. So all the Tory voters out in the nice suburbs they don't want to be part of London, but they are just because of Tony Blair. So we had to convince Tory voters to come out and vote in an election that they didn't want to vote in. But we also had to convince those soft, you know, nice sort of middle-class people who probably vote Lib Dem, sometimes Labor, to also vote for Boris. So we had to really get those, those two angles of, of people out. Um, Boris, what you see on the TV is what he's like privately. <laughs> so when you're an advisor for someone like that, it is a complete and utter nightmare in a way because <laughs> he is like a toddler. You turn your back and he's flushing the cat down the toilet and he's, <laughs> and he's writing on the wall. It just... So when you're an advisor, yeah, that's, that's why I've aged. That's why Lytton's aged. But, but, but beyond that sort of somewhat shambolic, bumbling schoolboy routine, there's a brain there, isn't there? A massive, massive brain. And all these people think that he's incompetent and he's just... Yeah, he's this bumbling sort of you know, Womble of Wimbledon type of person. <laughs> He's not. He's an incredibly intelligent person. He's incredibly thoughtful. You know, the education that he had as a King's Scholar to Eton and then also going to Oxford, that is the education he wants all kids in Britain to have, to learn, learn the magic of poetry, to understand the classics, to be able to, to read and write, which so many kids can't do. So those sinkhole estates, those terrible estates, in, in, especially in North London, he wanted those kids from underprivileged backgrounds to understand the mastery of the, of the English language. Don't you want someone like that to be proud? Well, his old classmates, I think his old Oxford class, classmates said, we always knew he was going to be Prime Minister one day. Did you know when he was running as London Mayor that he was destined for even greater things? Uh, all politicians think they're going to become Prime Minister. Uh, <laughs> so even, even those in the Senate sometimes think <laughs> that the Constitution may change. No, no. <laughs> but no, um, yeah, I think he's, he's always had that, that, or that, what I call the X factor. And that self belief that he's going to get somewhere. And because what happens is when he falls over, which he does all the time, uh, he picks himself up and, and keeps on going. I've, I've got two questions. Mm. One, he squibbed it when Cameron That's stepped what down. That's what we're talking about. And I think that shows a great out. weakness. I think that this reputation of him being a little bit flaky is, is, has been earned. Second question is about his very colourful personal life. <laughs> now, in politics these days, that can't be a burden. He kind of has some Teflon quality about him, but just talk us about how those two factors may play out. Yeah, he, he did squib it, but he learned from that, from that mistake. So, like John Howard... Why did he squib it? I just think he probably just thought he could get it through, through force of his personality when he realised, actually, he's got to do a bit of work to become Prime Minister. Mm. Uh, but that goes to a question that sometimes we, you know, have with, uh, with uh, that famous interview he did with um, the editor of The Spectator, uh, Andrew, Andrew Neil. Andrew Neil uh, yeah, know, yeah. And people said that he's not across his brief, even if he's very smart. But would you say that he's across his brief? Does he do the homework? Yeah, when he wants to be. Yeah. This, is, this is what he will do as Prime Minister, what he did at City Hall. He will delegate. He does, we don't want some sort of Kevin Rudd micromanager <laughs> counting pa paper clips. <laughs> he will get the secretaries of state and, and the junior ministers to do the work. That's what he did at City Hall. He got a guy in called Eddie Lister. Eddie Lister was leader of Wandsworth Borough Council. He was one of the Tory flagship uh, councils, always low council tax, always brilliant services. He was one of those councils that when John Major was re at his lowest, it still stayed Tory because it was such a good council. Eddie Lister... You know, he's going to go into Downing Street, as he did. He was, affected, he was chief of staff at City Hall. He makes sure the trains run on time. Boris will be out selling, selling the message. But back to his personal life. Mm. Um, 
We were very scared uh, during the campaign back in 7 8 about, about a sex scandal coming out because he's just, you know, he has a quite an irreverent approach to, to um, personal <laughs> views. <laughs> very colourful. Well, hang on. Very I'm, funny picking, way. I'm, I'm at Boris at the Spectator uh, garden party a couple of years ago and uh, he was there and he was surrounded by probably 20 women. Mm -hmm. About uh, a, half of them that is bedded, probably. And, and all over him, a lot of them, it was like Mick Jagger was there. Uh, well, he was very popular with the women, yes? Yeah, very, yeah, but he's been married for most of that time. He's very, very, very popular. So we were frightened there's going to be a, a sex scandal. So the Sunday papers in the UK are the, you know, the big selling yeah. papers. So the Sunday before polling day, we're terrified, sex scandal. Uh, we, we're, we're up at late Saturday night to see oh, what's, what's coming out, what's coming out. And of course, it was a sex scandal. It did involve a Tory, but not Boris. It was a Tory lord who had a three-in-a-bed romp in, in Monaco. So it was just like... <laughs> yes, but he Tories... does have a few love children here and there, and, 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 and there are a few episodes that could, do you think could be damaging no. or do you think he's above that? <laughs> exactly. I, think, I think he's moved beyond that. The thing about Boris is uh, in, the, in the mayoral campaign he had a, a positive honesty rating. No politicians have positive honesty ratings because he puts his foot in it, he gets called out and he has to apologise. Whether it's, you know, what happened in Liverpool or saying that the women in Portsmouth have, have the, you know, the big knockers, um, <laughs> what he said about people in Papua New Guinea. People sort of like that because he's not one of those boring so, people. So, it's authentic. So, yes, authentic. So I want to get, we don't have much time left, I want to get to Australia. How does this play, how does Boris Johnson being in number 10, are we looking at a free trade agreement? What's happening? Is this good for Australia that he is in Downing Street? This is brilliant for Australia. I mean, Theresa May was also a friend of Australia, but Boris loves Australia because he, he understands us in terms of our, our sunny disposition. He spent some time here. And he spent some time here. <laughs> so having someone, and he needs to deliver. So have you spoken to him since he became... No, here? I've sent him a message, but like, right. I don't expect him to respond. And in your message, did you say you'll be seeing him on Outsiders? He's coming on Outsiders? I didn't say that, but I can send him, I sent him, I sent him another please. message. I'll do Excellent. that for you guys. Fantastic. OK, right. Good man. Yes. Excellent. <laughs> this is what we want to see. Because we've got to convince Rita that Boris is going to be sensational. He's hit the ground running. He's, he's, he's taken it up to the French and said, rack off. Are you uh, <laughs> positive, optimistic about October 31st and Brexit? Uh, yeah, very positive, because he needs to deliver it to stop Jeremy Corbyn becoming Prime Minister. And this this is the real game here. Yes, it's, it's Brexit, but remember Brexit's destroyed the last four Prime Ministers, if, uh, four uh, Tory Prime Ministers. You could say it destroyed Heath's leadership too to make it five. He needs to deliver Brexit so he can stop Corbyn. And that's and he, he's in the national told the Europeans, forget the backstop, that's out of here. Yeah, Not, yeah. And that's, that's learning from Trump, isn't it? He's going the Trump route and going, oh, yeah. going in hard. Mm. No yeah. deal. Yeah. He's no put deal. no deal on the table. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. Good, so your mission, James, should you choose to accept it, is to make sure you get Boris onto this show. Then we can all we can all quiz him about it and convince Rita. You watch Rita will go all, you know. <laughs> if he delivers Brexit, I will not go all. Oh, no. But if he delivers Brexit, it's got a very short window of time. I mean, that is the next election one, isn't it? I mean, if he can manage to deliver... Yes. Because we, we, want the, we want the Tories to stop talking about Europe and focus on, on, on delivering public services and cutting taxes. And, and Europe is a, is a divisive issue for the Tory party and still for the country. So they just need to deal with it. And very, very briefly, ScoMo and Bojo? Uh, it's a bromance. <laughs> it's a bromance. <laughs> you heard it here on Outsiders, as always. We've got more coming up still. And don't go away. We've got some hyperbole for you. Back in a tick. Thanks, James. No worries. Thanks,